For most of us, the property we buy is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, purchases we'll ever do. So it's very important that we do research it, we do understand it, and we do understand how to analyze it. Usually, when someone of us is trying to buy a microwave, he will analyze and assess and research for hours, but sometimes days, just to save few tens or a hundred. How about when you're doing the biggest purchase in your life? Analyzing property, I'm Makram Hani, and I hope I'm adding value. I'm trying to work on the material provided, but also in how is it presented, to make sure I simplify complex matters to make it simple for everyone to understand and apply so that you can invest in property with more knowledge and be better informed. Today, we'll be analyzing a Springs three-bedroom townhouse. Springs is a community of townhouses in the center of Dubai. It's in an area called Emirates Living. Springs is known for its good quality community, secure as everywhere else in Dubai, yet even more secure because it's a gated community. It's by Amar, which is one of the most prominent developers, actually the most prominent developer, and obviously the developer that is known for building the best communities, quality-wise, maintenance-wise. Um, and, and in general, it's a loved area by families. Let's start by diving into Springs. We'll talk fundamentals, we'll talk numbers. Hopefully by the end of the session, you will be able to analyze and really discover. And that's a property I was looking at. I was looking at to buy. I ended up uh, not buying yet. I will be putting an offer hopefully today on it. So prior to you seeing this, I will be putting an offer hopefully. It probably will close or not. I will only know uh, within the coming day or two. Um, yet I'm sure that many of you will be in a similar situation trying to buy a home in a good area and want to analyze it. Let's analyze it together. Today, our analysis will go on several elements. I, um, I believe we found the right format. I'm hearing good feedback about the way the data and what data is presented. Um, I will do a session on how to come up with each part of this data. We've done a session already on how to come up on, with costs. Um, we've done a session on why to buy with mortgage or uh, not. We've done a session on buy off plan or not. Um, we've done a session that you will see hopefully today. It's stress testing your portfolio. We, we are doing core sessions on the basics of how to look at your property, um, how to look at developing your portfolio so that you can develop wealth in the best way possible, in the safest way possible. And usually the safest way is the, most, is the way where you're most informed. Only invest in what you know and understand. And knowing that all of us will want or need to invest in property once at least in our life, and let's hope that we can make it multiple, it's very important that we are well informed about how to analyze property. So, as we said, it's a three bedroom in the Springs. It's a three bedroom townhouse. It's in a part of Springs that is directly beside Meadows. So for those who know the area, it's in Springs 1. And Springs 1 and 2 usually are the nearest to Meadows. Um, it's easier access than others as a part of the community as a cluster. At the same time, they were built at different times than other parts of the community. There are some differences in the layout and the structure. Um, we'll go through um, the details of what has been offered uh, to me. And um, the, the property has been offered to me at a price of uh, 2.4 million dirhams. Um, this is the market price today. I obviously would not buy it at this price, I'm not trying to buy a live-in property over here. 
I'm trying to buy a uh, property that I would be able to lease. The good thing about this property is that, um, as I said, it has a good quality tenant in general if you lease it. We'll see now that with townhouses, there is a different structure of service charges. Now, I'm sure that many of you think that in a townhouse, I don't pay service charges, yet that's not right. So wait with me till the end, and hopefully you'll get info and knowledge that you don't have today and that will help you in your decision making tomorrow. The uh, property that we're looking at, as we said, is a three bedroom, 2.4 million. Um, it's a 205 square meters. And um, this specific uh, three bedroom does not have an extended garden, which some of those do have. Uh, it does have a, a normal uh, plot, a normal garden. The rent, rental income of this property currently is 184,800. That's the current contract on it. I expect that um, the current rent could have been higher if it's a new lease, but this is a slightly older lease and they've grown the price to reach this. That's why it's not an uh, even number. As usual, we've taken the rent. This is what we start with because we start with cash flow. This is what I see relevant to start with. We've looked at the vacancy rate and we've calculated with each other the vacancy rate before and we assume that there is a vacancy rate. Now, you don't need to while you're analyzing property because remember here, I'm not advising you to buy or not. I'm sharing with you what I would do and you have to decide if it's right for you to buy or not. You have to do your own analysis. Um, you can assume a vacancy rate which is smaller or bigger than the one I'm assuming. That's back to you. That's up to you. Um, I assume a vacancy rate which is slightly more excessive than usual. Um, how to assume a vacancy rate or how to calculate a vacancy rate. Usually you take the average stay of a tenant in an area or a city or a location or a locality and what you do is you um, assume how long would it take or discover how long would it take usually to lease a property there at market rent in normal market conditions again there's sometimes where you have abnormal market conditions positively or negatively slower to rent or mu much more faster to uh, to rent and what you do is you um, divide that a uh, uh, period which is the weeks it takes to lease the property out prepare it and lease it because remember you have preparation time especially if you're not managing it so efficient that preparation time will be slightly longer than usual and then you divide that by the number of years with some contingency now here is where i leave some more contingency than needed because i better be safe than sorry so we look at the revenues, we take expenses, and we reach now expenses and the detailing of expenses. Why did we derive this much expenses and how did we? Um, because, because you all know that service charges on a townhouse is less. Because remember, we said the service charge, and I'll draw it here, service charge takes care of your community but not your building, and then your building, and this is called community. Uh, levy charge and then your building but not your apartment and this is called the building levy charge or and and both of those components in addition to the um, sinking fund which could be considered part of this component all of those components together are considered the service charge now in an apartment you're paying the operation of the building because you are paying ac and elevators and um, external painting and all of those for a building in a townhouse or a villa this is not there so you only pay the community levy so it will end up between 1.5 to uh, 3 uh, slightly more sometimes ad here you can have dollar somewhere else ad per square uh, per square foot which is much cheaper again that means that you need to assume more for maintenance because you would need to um, manage your building on your own, operate your building. You would need to clean your water tank um, on your own. You would need to paint the property from outside on your own. You would need to cool the property much more because there's no surrounding that is cooled. So all of those, the parking space, you would need to manage it on your own and, and maintain it. So all of those elements, are to be taken care of thus those create a lower service levy a higher maintenance cost 
remember that. So to go back, the net operating income and then the financing cost. As you know, I, I, I look at buying property through, um, uh, through mortgage. And um, if I can get the highest mortgage possible, although I always uh, take a reasonable, logical approach to that because excessive borrowing is not uh, um, expected uh, to be good to you and is not good to you, actually. And it can be disastrous if you do it the wrong way. So be very careful with borrowing. Thanks God, the central bank and the banks are logical now with what they lend you and how they lend you and what they do they lend you based on. So in general, it's very rare to see someone who's over leveraged today. Now, you have here an operating cash flow and the immediate thing that jumps to mind is that guys, you do have a decent amount of operating cash flow in this property, which I like as a as a first as a first look on this property, I do like. And as we know, this grows with time, as we said. So it grows here, and then it grows here, and then it grows here, okay? And then it grows, and every year we go through the five years, it does grow. Now, this is not where the magic happens. Remember, numbers do dance, so they will dance in a second. Um, the magic happens in the longer term, but we still, can see a significant amount and now we'll see the graph of operating cash flow to income and we see the kind of growth that is achieved over there so the property that we're looking at obviously has a, a positive uh, cash flow um, and and has a positive cash flow day one hour one uh, which is which is um, very um, very good now uh, um, remember that that here you can have or some people include the purchase expenses as a uh, an operating expenses i don't like that i would uh, prefer to add it as a uh, as a uh, as a as a as a cap capex as a capital expenditure it's part of the purchase of the property it's part of the price so i look at an all inclusive price now you will see here, guys, that I have an offer price. So why did I include this? I'll explain to you in a second. And what does it uh, resemble? And it says 94% of the asking price. And now I'll, I'll tell you what does this resemble as well. Now, in general, uh, the, the properties offered, you can figure out from your agent or from the party offering to you can figure out what was the best offered on that. Now, that doesn't have to be always accurate. Now, in my situation, I get more accurate knowledge than usual because I have brokerage, <laughs> brokerage and I understand brokerage and I've been uh, in brokerage since a very long time. Although uh, today I don't operate a brokerage, but I still own one. At the same time, brokers in the market understand that. So my network of brokers does not deal with me the same way they would deal with anyone who's a past buyer. There are brokers who make plenty of thousands, hundreds of thousands a year just selling to me and selling for me afterwards. So in general, you can get a figure or I can get a figure that is resembles what was offered and what does it look like now? So the offer price of what is expected to be accepted on this property is the offer price that I've put here. Um, why? Because it resembles to us the possibilities. So we're not really um, we're not really analyzing the asking price without analyzing the possible achievable price. Now, will we buy at the possible achievable price? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, yet this is the possible achievable price as per the agent, the broker who offered this property uh, to me. He happens to be a very honest, decent gentleman. I've dealt with him since a very long time. And usually um, he's honest to both parties. And I like brokers who are honest to both parties. They would, um, they would not try to abuse any of the parties. Both parties understand their uh, their risk and their uh, their reward, and both parties understand how good is the um, how good is the investment for them. Now, um, here we look at the cap cap rate, the capitalization rate, and uh, we see that it's a decent cap rate. We look at the cash on cash return, and we'll ignore this on the first year 
the minus because as we said over here I included the um, cost of purchase as part of the operating cost now um, I've, I've tried for you different models the coming session I'll stop including it as an operating cost I just want to show everyone if you do that how do you assume things because if it, you consider it an operating cost it means you're overloading the first year and then the years later on um, uh, it's it, it looks better but it doesn't signify a decent enough number because you need to discount that as you as you go and because it's a one-time cost it's supposed to be part of your purchase price now Year two onwards, you will see that the cash on cash return is 9% and growing. It's a decent cash on cash return. Um, I would say it's a very good cash on cash return. Now, the IRR also is uh, reasonable and actually it's great. It's very good as an IRR. And the multiplier, the gross rent multiplier that we talked about last time is great. For whoever, guys, have not seen the previous session go back please to the previous session and and see this after you finish this because it talks to you about those details um, I will include at the end of this um, at the end of this session um, some links that tell you about the um, or that give you the basics some core videos because core is very important fundamentals live throughout all our uh, sessions and through all our analysis now as you see and as you know the law balance drops with time and the equity build up and it builds up well and um, again guys here is where the numbers start dancing we're still only in five years on but we see that the kind of equity we built over this five years on top of the cash that we've been accumulating is very good actually within that five years we bought 30 percent or 20 ish percent more of a property 30 is wrong 20 ish percent more of a property just by us paying what the rent is is getting us or part of what the rent is paying getting us and we've accumulated investable cash on top of that that is the positive cash flow coming to us now You'll see on top, by the way, here, the price per square foot and the price per square meter. I don't give so much, uh, uh, so much um, uh, influence for that in my analysis today. Not because I don't look at it. I do look at it, but because people give over uh, influence for that and they take over consideration to that. That's why I decided not to give it consideration. Um, yet it is important because it is an indicator um, price compared to intrinsic value as well as price to com compare to um, uh, cost and historic values so we take usually the price per square foot because it's a better unit uh, that is um, more relevant in, in comparable terms now if you have any questions by the way while you uh, listen drop it down in the comments um, I'll be answering it either privately or if I see that it helps everyone else, I'll be answering it publicly. So um, we go here to where the numbers start dancing properly. Year 10, year 15, year 20, year 25, year 30, year 35. And please, none of you should tell me that, oh man, you're telling me 35 years from now. I'm now 40, that's 75. Are you serious? I tell you, <laughs> count it to 100. Uh, if you do, do not get that far, um, that's that's uh, life. If you do, uh, at least you can live good years now and then. Um, at least from a cash point of view, because yeah, the life is not only the the money you make, but uh, the money you make allows you to make much of the life you have. Yeah. So vacancy rate, as we said. I assume that and I assume a growth to that and I've assumed the growth of 2% as you've seen in the beginning. Revenues, again, expenses, and here we'll talk about expenses. Again, we look at the net operating income at that time and the cash flow at that time. Guys, if you see in 30 years, we'll be approximately getting a 50% of our 
equity every year or more. Uh, here it's 50% approximately, 40-ish percent. As a cash, um, as an operating cash flow, a positive operating cash flow, that tells you of how wealth can grow with time. And that tells you that property not only allows you wealth generation and wealth creation and wealth development, but allows you a change of your future generations uh, trajectory, wealth growth trajectory. So give so much attention to that, in my opinion. Now, and here, I, as usual, I lost one of, or where are we going with the slides? And here I go, guys, to the, the cap rate year 10 to year 35. Uh, I'll not go in details on this because I'm trying to give you shorter analysis sessions so that I wouldn't take much of your time. Um, you, again, numbers are dancing here. The, 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 um, uh, with time, by the way, I wanted to tell you about something that I was asked about privately. And the, rent, the gross rent multiplier is dropping with time. Now, with time, guys, you need to look at what to keep, what to reposition. That's why our portfolios, although it's buy and hold, it's dynamic. So, um, and, and here on buy and hold, because I was asked also this question, and they, they know that sometimes I don't buy and hold, and in general, I buy and hold. And I say there's property that is not to be sold now, it's to be sold in the future. But there's other properties that I never get so emotionally attached to it. I would tell you, if you're wealth generating, if you're wealth developing today, you need to start by being slightly more aggressive than buy and hold forever. Um, and it depends on the uh, tax regime you're in and, and how do other factors play. If you're in a non-tax um, or zero tax regime, like the one I'm in, I'm in Dubai, UAE, and we don't pay income tax here, we don't pay tax on uh, capital gains. Yeah, yeah, come in. Um, but all of this is positive for us. So if you buy and sell in a few years or in a few months, you wouldn't incur higher cost of tax. So it may be relevant sometimes to exit that way rather than to exit of what we call an exit, no exit, where you exit by taking equity out. While if you're in the US, it most probably and definitely most of the time makes more sense to take equity out of a property rather than just um, exit it because that creates a taxable event while if you, uh, and I'm not a tax advisor here, while if you uh, have a different, uh, a different exit, which is an equity exit, you've created actually um, a way to defer more taxes because uh, the cost of a loan is considered a cost and is, it decreases the uh, tax burden you have. So that is something to look at and to, to understand. Now, here we use the expenses and uh, um, uh, the financing assumption I'll not go into depth with, but I, as I've said last time, I assume here um, that um, we, we take an 80% loan to value LTV, we, pay, we put 20% down payment, you can assume 60%, 40%. Now, in general, I always assume 80-20, although I cannot today get 80-20 because I'm an investor and an investor can get 50 to 60% at best, um, depending on the property he's buying. Sometimes he cannot get the 60% even. But I assume that because some money is lent by the bank, call it whatever bank it is, it could be HSBC, the rest of the money is lent by Macram's bank to Macram's fund, to Arms and McGregor Investments. So I lend myself or my company money or my bank lends my company money because I don't believe I own any money. It's my bank and my company that own the money. And, and then they, they, what they do uh, over there is they lend the money so that that bank can collect so I'm fair with my bank as much as I'm fair with international banks and national banks. Now, we'll cross here, but we'll go to the cost service charges. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Insurance, maintenance, miscellaneous, management. And here I've included management. You remember I've done one model without management because I uh, wanted to show you 
that it has a big impact on costs sometimes. Here you see the service charges is smaller and you'll see that insurance is approximately the same as other properties, yet maintenance is higher um, and, and um, miscellaneous is approximately the same and management is approximately the same. Now, why do we have maintenance here as slightly higher than usual? Although it's not higher than what I assume. I assume approximately 2 to 3%. And I believe 3% of the rental is fair. Um, here, I've assumed uh, slightly more than 3% or slightly more than 2%. And, and uh, um, I assume that for a reason, because we're in a townhouse and you will be paying most probably higher cost. If a pump gets damaged in a house, you will not think about it. The building will fix it in, a, in an apartment, in a house, in a townhouse, in a villa, you will need to fix it. And this costs money. So um, those are the investment split. And here we go to very fast through the, the graphs that we have to see that the here the management cost is very significant. Um, here, the the um, the um, the maintenance cost is very significant, and those form together the biggest part of the cost. While in general, in usual uh, situations, the those will be the service levy. So here, it's not the service levy because it's a townhouse. Now, we look at the revenues and operation operating cash flows, and we see that it's very healthy growth that it's achieving. Cash flow, guys, are, is very important because regardless of what the market values are doing up or down, as long as you're renting the property, it's giving you cash flow, that cash flow can be reinvested. So if property prices drop, the cash flow is still decent. You take that cash flow, you can have much more for your money if you reinvest into the market. So you will be investing, and this is the kind of cycle of infinite returns that you need to look at and understand. Now. We reach fundamentals and what is our target on this property? Uh, look, I like the property fundamentals. I like this specific property's fundamentals because I believe that it has an unrivaled location. Why? You tell me it's not downtown. It's not the seafront. I tell you it's a great location and it's a house very central. So usually when you have those houses, you only have such upscale neighborhoods very near to the beach or very near to downtown. When you have such an upscale neighborhood, or actually it's a middle class neighborhood um, in, in, a, in, a, in a central location like that, and it's villas, it's townhouses, it's houses, um, that is, in my view, unrivaled. Because if you have a house on the beach or downtown, that's ultra luxury location wise. But this is very decent and unrivaled. So you have this is a positive to it. You have no views here, so we'll not consider views. And you have a decent layout, although I believe those properties lack spaciousness. They would need to be slightly more spacious, and you need to spend much money on them to make it slightly more spacious, which is in general not feasible. So I would say fundamentals are to its advantage because of the unrivaled part of the location, and that's a plus a positive, not an X. So here is a positive. And um, I believe that's, that's, that's a positive thing. It's a good community in a good location with, with a good proximity to everything around you. Now, it's slightly old, by the way, as a community, which may be part of the opportunity because those properties are target for rehab. Uh, whenever you're looking at such a property, you would usually think that you take it on, uh, refurbish it as a whole, and then it will resemble much more value for a tenant or for a buyer. Now, um, it has positive cash flow. Actually, it has significant positive cash flow. Value increase um, here because it has a possibility of a rehab. It has such an arrival location. I would say yes, although I would tell you whoever is buying property in Dubai today in 2022, um, villas in general have risen much more than apartments, in, relatively speaking, to last year. Um, yet the most growth that is um, probably at a much higher level percentage-wise would be the ultra-luxury houses and villas. Here it has grown, yet I still believe that it is within the 
and numbers show actually, I don't need to believe or you believe me, um, the numbers show that it's still within the, um, the uh, logical numbers. Uh, possibility of a rehab, definitely. Uh, refinance possibility, I doubt that there will be a possibility of, of refinance. Increase income, Look, I believe that you may have incremental income with time. You can increase income if you do a rehab. Yet, if you want to increase income in its current situation, uh, you would need to exit the existing tenant, which will regularly take uh, money, cost you money, because you would need to um, take that tenant out of the property and uh, you can't force him out. You would need to talk to him, discuss with him on how would he get out if you're keeping it as a rental property, or I would advise you to discuss with him him staying. If you have a good tenant, he's paying money and he's paying uh, his payments on time, he takes care of your property, you tell him, you know what, I want to improve that property. How about if I improve it and we improve your rent? And in general, people would like that, would accept that. And you tell me, what would I do? He's living in the property. I tell you, discuss with him. Maybe he'll tell you, yeah, if you would do that, and you give me a discount on what the property should rent at at that time, I will move for a month somewhere or I will store my stuff for the one month uh, summer break and then you do the uh, upgrade at that time. So there is opportunity for that. So I'd say there is an opportunity to increase income. Risks, drop of income, there is a risk of drop of income and it is significant because the area is old. However, I believe you have a certain amount of stability because of the consistency of income and um, this area could generate and the low cost. So you have a lower cost generally for such a property than other areas. So I would say that this is average. So this is not a, a, a giant risk. It's a little risk. Value drop, I do not believe that you can drop much in value unless the market really changed. I believe you can add value here. So I will not consider this as a big possibility, although this is always a possibility. Yeah, it's, it's never not a possibility that value does drop. And then here we have unexpected costs and unexpected costs in here is huge. So this is always a possibility. Now, can you limit those by taking a contractor to check the property and, and looking at fundamental details in a property? Yes, you can. Can you eliminate it? I don't believe you can eliminate it. So this is something that you need also to consider. In general, I would tell you the following. In general, I like the property. I like what I see. And um, I would buy this property. Now, I would love to see it at a better uh, price. Although the numbers are good, I want a slightly higher cap and um, and I would buy it. And I will be putting a, an offer on it prior to you seeing this session. Um, thank you for joining me again on Analyzing Property. I hope I'm adding value. Give me your comments. I improved this time the system. I've changed the whole system because I believe our system was glitching and, and our picture was getting stuck. I've improved the audio. I improved the picture, although this is as good as I can look. Yeah, so um, no camera can make me look better. But um, join me. Continue with me. If you have any property you would like me to analyze for you, feel free to drop it in the comments. And um, welcome on uh, this journey. Ciao.